So um, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you are well. Um, thank you for your time this afternoon. Um, it's been a real pleasure working with a group of chartered environmentalists to create this report. And I'm absolutely delighted uh, that it is published and that we are all able to, to speak about it today. Um, I think one of the key things for me is that, um, as somebody has said before, we are not at the end. Um, I think we're at the beginning of the end of the beginning. Um, and there's an awful lot of work to do off the back of this report. And we'll come back to that later on as well. Um, but a, a really fabulous piece of work and a massive thank you from me to everybody who's been involved in this. Um, and I'm looking forward to taking the next steps with you as we move forward from now on. So we've got a really um, interesting agenda. We're going to hear from uh, from Bridget, first of all. We're going to hear from Martin, who has led this work, from Adam, Chief Exec, one of our licensed members. Uh, we have a panel. So if you have questions, please pop them into the, uh, the chat function, or we'll give you an opportunity to ask your questions as well. And then we will think about what comes next as well. So yes, yeah, so. Um, we're going to talk about the report in a bit of detail. We're going to give you some perspectives. As I said, some Q&A, um, and then we are going to talk about what comes next. So you can use the chat function on your toolbar, um, either to ask a question or to discuss with other delegates as we move on as well. Um, so I'm uh, really delighted to introduce uh, Bridget from UK Soils. Bridget is a professor up in Bangor who has um, real expertise in this area. And it was a real pleasure to speak to her about this. So, um, Bridget, over to you. Thank you. So hopefully you can hear me. Is that all right? I can hear you perfectly, Bridget. Fantastic. So it says the importance of the Society for the Environment Soils and Stones report. I'm absolutely thrilled this has come out now. It is so timely and the quality of the work is just fantastic. And it just aligns with so many other things that people have been pushing for. So next slide, please. Yay. OK, so. I'm sure one of the reasons this has been um, pushed is that we have a problem with soils globally. And there we got Franklin Roosevelt. This isn't a new problem. We knew that destroying soil um, is not a good thing for your economy, for people or for nature or for climate or anything. So all over the world, we've got problems. And we might think in the UK, we are um, protected from some of the worst. And there is, a, there is a point in that. We are lucky, we live in a temperate climate and we don't get, tend to get some of the absolute devastating effects of others, but we still have problems. Next slide, please. So the title, 60 to 70% of EU soils are unhealthy. Um, and it's just really to let you know that we might think the problems in Africa or Asia or South, uh, South America, but we, in a recent analysis of EU soils, have calculated 60 to 70% of EU soils have an issue which suggests they are in some form of degradation directly due to our management practices. So we've got many contaminated sites of which many haven't even been inventoried. We've got residual pesticides in our soils. We've got agricultural soils at risk, uh, which are eutrophied and risk water and biodiversity. We know our cropland soils are losing carbon and we've got unsustainable water erosion rates. Next slide, please. So the question might be, that's the EU, we've come out. So is the UK different? Well, the U 2016 parliamentary inquiry into soil health stated that soil is a Cinderella environmental issue. And despite soil health and many functions, it just doesn't receive the attention that we give to air quality, water and biodiversity. So that was back in 2016, we said there was a, an issue. And the issues the inquiry pointed to was an 11% in carbon since 1978 in our cropland soils, unsustainable use of peats, hot spots of erosion, unknown numbers of contaminated sites, and we don't even know our situation because we've not had any national monitoring since 2007. Next slide, please. So in the EU, they are so concerned, and I do know we're out, but just it, we still have a lot of business with the EU. They've, I'm sure you've all heard of the moonshot idea. So critical areas that need a step change in what we're doing. And the EU has defined five mission areas. So things like cancer, climate neutral cities, the oceans, 
and climate change societal transformation. And look, soil health and food is right in there as one of the key issues we need to focus on. So a lot of work going on in the EU, and I'm gonna come back to what that means for us here in the UK. So next slide, please. And the report mentions it's that soil is absolutely critical for delivery of the UN SDGs, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Unfortunately, in a lot of the goals, they don't explicitly mention soil terribly often, but a lot of work has been done to show that many of the goals cannot be reached unless we look after our soils and stones. And apologies for not mentioning stones so much, it's just not my expertise. Next slide. So bullet points that I've extracted out of the report, which is the need for action. So the first thing that you've pointed out is the need for collective action. And this report is just a great example. All power to all the coming together to produce all the recommendations. One of the things you highlight is better uptake of best practices across all land use sectors. We do already know a lot of what to do. We just need more of it happening. We also need new innovative management practices. And I'm thrilled in a way that you mentioned some of the soil sparing technologies. I haven't been able to get that into the mission because they want to focus on how we directly manage soil. But I do think some of these soil sparing technologies, you've got hydroponics, phonics, I've said their apologies. Also cellular food production is something we need to think about. You also mention in the report, which I think is absolutely spot on, we need benchmarks for soil health. How can we expect our land managers to focus and to be able to know where they are unless we give them benchmarks? And work is ongoing now with that. Also, there's a mention of digital platforms. Absolutely, we need to be able to better share what's going on and to exchange information to move towards what I think is absolutely critical and you've identified, which is a circular economy for soils. We need use and reuse of our soils to not waste, goodness, not go to landfill, to better use our wastes as well um, as we go forward. And so there's an urgent and practical need for action across. And now you do focus on death for the 25 year plan. I would just extend that out to all four nations of the UK. Environment, agriculture, and many issues are devolved. And so we need to work with our governments across all the four nations of the UK as we move forward. Next slide, please. So my challenge for the UK is the EU has this mission. By 2030, 75% of our soils will be healthy or showing a significant improvement. So that's basically a turnaround. Currently we've got 60 to 70% are unhealthy. So my challenge to everyone is will the UK get left behind or, we are, or are we gonna lead from the front, which I think is what your report shows specific actions that we need to do, policy and practical actions that we need to do to make sure we're right up there as a global um, exemplar of how to look after your soils in a sustainable way and improve and, and sort out the degradation we've happened, that's happened. Next slide, please. So we've established um, with various partners, a new UK Soils Community Hub, online hub. There's the web link that you can go to. We were trying to uh, increase access to information. There's some fabulous web uh, resources out there to tell people uh, apps, videos, films, guidance materials, many, many sources of information. We've tried to pull it all together, acting as signposting for that. We're also running monthly soil debates on a wide range of topics. We host, have we've got a search uh, function that lets you access things. So right after this, we will be putting your report up onto here to make sure everyone can find it and point to your website and point to your report. And I just wanna make a point particularly about the living labs and lighthouses you can see just in one of the rolling banners if you go onto the website. The, there's, there's a real interest in trying to develop living labs and lighthouses, which are innovation platforms where people with real problems are testing out new uh, ideas for soil, where they're developing, they're doing it working in a transdisciplinary way, um, and it's for all soils, not just farming, it's for forestry and urban systems and what have you. Going forward, the UK has bought into EU funding and it's highly likely that a, a lot of the research funding is going to be focused around these innovation and research platforms. There's gonna be clusters of them, one to 2000 of them across the EU. And what I hope is that we will work together and establish living labs and lighthouses all across the UK, which act as both demonstration uh, platforms of best practice, 
but also innovative platforms where we can test new ideas going forward. If you go to the UK Soils website, you can find out more about these living lab houses and lighthouses. You can register if you think you've already got one. And going forward, we'll also be establishing, we hope, community forum where people can try and connect together to create these clusters. So all in all, I just want to really warmly welcome and congratulate everyone on the report. It is so timely, as I said, and the calls for action that you've identified just tick nearly every box I've had. I can't keep up with journalists at the moment contacting me about soils. Uh, so this is just so timely and I hope you get great press and great uptake for it. With that, I'll leave it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bridget. And we'll we'll follow up with you on the on the titles and then make that available to everybody. Um, and also make sure that you all have the link to the hub uh, that Bridget has talked about as well. So you can go and look at the uh, the lighthouses, obviously find the report, but also the debates as well that she mentioned. So thank you so much for that. Okay, so moving on to our next presentation, and I'm really delighted uh, for uh, Martin to be doing this. So um, back in 2019, Martin came to visit us in the uh, Stockham HQ office uh, when we were allowed to be in an office, um, and we were talking and he was explaining the one of the challenges around uh, stones and soil and it not being seen as a resource and not being seen as valuable um, and I said well why don't you lead a group and we'll do something about it or we'll look to do it and today's uh, report is the kind of the outcome of that so firstly Martin a massive thank you for taking on that challenge and taking it forward um, and over to you. Lovely thank you very much for that welcome Emma and uh, fantastic to see so many of you this afternoon many of whom uh, have played such an instrumental part of being part of the group and having only met physically once uh, due to COVID to still carry on regardless and to create uh, uh, such a dynamic outcome um, of our concerns, the issues that we raised and explored um, and our uh, desire to see urgent action is really a testament to your tenacity. Uh, so very well done uh, to you all and I'm, I'm delighted to have represented you to to have pulled um, the the knowledge and expertise together and to share and discuss common concerns and realize that despite having that conversation with uh, with Emma and the team that I wasn't alone with my concern and that actually we, we're all in our own way uh, saw a, a similar uh, challenge for soils and stones and that it wasn't on par uh, still with air quality, with water quality and biodiversity, even since uh, that first call uh, most recently in 2016. But uh, as of course, as, as, as Bridget has so well said, it's not a new issue. Um, but now the time is all the more urgent for us to work together. Um, next slide, if, if you could, please. Thank you. Um, so re really the concerns that <clears throat> when we first had our, our conversations, back in December 2019 um, was uh, around risk um, uh, compliance and opportunity for soils and stones. The risk of uh, waste being moved as, as a material illicitly, that we weren't having the right compliance and focus and understanding uh, of how we could effectively use this valuable resource. And actually there was a clear opportunity for us to work together to raise awareness uh, and to improve the position for, for each of the sectors that were, were represented. And we just hop on to the next slide, please, Sarah. Um, and, and so looking at what we set out to achieve top left, 32 chartered environmentalists met in the first uh, instant. Um, and, and that I think was you know, a testament to the passion that was out there for Soils and Stone. I think well, the first conversation that we had, we thought, well, maybe we might get a dozen um, that might come forward. But to have 32 and such of a high calibre uh, and competence um, was tremendous. And we then split ourselves into four subgroups that met four to six times, dependent on the, the topic, to pull together uh, a soil that created those the, the highlight on the, the risks and issues, not to repeat the existing and strong scientific evidence that's out there. We've not intended to do that. The, the, the science is sound 
and indeed on our journey we've met um, many who have been able to provide that that evidence and we've tried to cite that correctly within the, the report for the readers to uh, to look at that in, in their own in their own uh, in their own way what we were most keen to do was to highlight the urgency and to spotlight the action that was needed um, uh, because we had three prime concerns or risks that the profile remained um, remained dim um, that the uh, profile with SOCM members needed a greater collaborative effort um, and that we needed to really absolutely see through on what we'd begun and therefore we came up with 32 calls for action within the chapter themes uh, with a program of action that you'll see to the tail of the report. We, we engaged with a wide variety of, um, uh, of, of stakeholders as you can see in the left hand side and this is but the start of a journey we are by no means at, a, at an end point we've we've achieved a fantastic milestone of pulling together um, our concerns our issues and opportunities but now the work really must begin and if we can just jump onto the next slide we can build up on that <clears throat> um, so that <clears throat> what we've proven to ourselves is that there is absolute cross-sector consensus um, with the need to understand the right language that you know it's not soil and stone is not a waste it's not muck it's not dirt it's a valuable resource with the huge potential of binding carbon mitigating climate change and actually if it's managed in the correct way consistently is, is a good valuable material that can be reused but it demands strong custodianship um, between all sectors um, rather than the individual sector focused approach that might be tended to, to, to see to be seen at, at present and that demands collaboration from us. Um, the, the cross sector benefits are, are wide and um, the, you know, we've spoken about soil health, um, Bridget mentioned that, but how we track the material and demonstrate that we have a strong circular economy and understand the common issues um, that we all face. Um, really, how can we overcome a potentially disparate regulatory structure as exists now, uh, where we don't have the auditory assurance and rigor that we need for, for this most valuable of, of materials and resource? On to the next slide, please. Um, the, the four themes um, you can see here, the chapter headings uh, are set out. Um, uh, there's possibly no right, right or wrong way to structure it, but this seemed to us the, the most um, practical way of, of tackling uh, the topic of store and stones. And just looking at some of the, the good practice and the issues and opportunities and the example given here around the definition of waste code of practice, which is managed by uh, an organisation called Clare. Um, and uh, it, it provides a, a mechanism for donor and receiver sites, um, but actually could, could that mechanism of material management planning be improved? Um, uh, and there's a number of recommendations in the report where we've identified opportunities to uh, help it um, uh, perhaps serve um, broader uh, sectors uh, than um, uh, development and construction, given that soil and stone is used uh, across all land management sectors. Uh, on, on to the next slide, please. Um, one of the examples of the outcome of the report was uh, this as a TOES assessment, a, a threats, opportunities, weakness, strengths assessment, um, particularly in mind that the Environment Agency uh, were reviewing a number of the protocols. So we provided a, a letter of, uh, of support to the need of that review and some recommendations early on. That was one of the, the early... Uh, um, uh, outcomes of, of our efforts. On to the next slide, please. We also believe that it would be remiss of us not to look at the sustainable development goals um, and map uh, how soil and stone and the focus on, on, the, on, on how we manage um, the, the materials um, uh, affects each of the uh, the development goals, and I'm not going to go into detail of, of these now. You can see our um, our rationale 
um, uh, within the uh, within the table of the report that maps um, how soils and stones are so valuable, important to help us deliver against the the goals. On, on to the next slide, please. Um, the the outcome of of the report has set out uh, thirty two uh, calls to action, which are broadly set out in these themes of coordinating a stakeholder response. How can we collaborate together to get engage and influence key stakeholders? And there's there's a number of specific actions uh, there, which provides the overall framework for um, uh, for the other four areas around harmonising legislation and policy. And we're, we're calling for uh, the need of a soils and stones framework, um, uh, a much more efficient, cohesive legislative focus on, on protecting soils and stones. There's a water framework directive, um, there's, there's water resources uh, legislation, but there's nothing specific on, on soils and stones, for example. The green industrial revolution has really taken shape in particular after the recognition uh, of the last 12 months um, in, in lockdown and the need to build back better. Uh, and we absolutely see the opportunity that um, soils and stones and the focus of it uh, could have for uh, building our economy back more sustainably. And within that, a number of commercial leader, levers being needed to incentivize the right practice and you know, under the polluter pays principle, penalise unsustainable practices and, and have that clarity. But within that, you only get what you push for. And we believe that by sharing and supporting good practice between sectors, uh, if, if we promote what we see as best, then uh, we'll get the, the behaviour that, that we all deserve and, uh, uh, and wish to see. And you know, with the UK Soils platform, that provides a fantastic opportunity for for us to do just that. To the next slide, please. And so there's a number of common opportunities and I'm, I'm conscious of our time this afternoon, but th th these next two slides really just provide some of the bullet points that allow you to, to read and digest in the report a bit more, but you know, some of them that I've touched on, um, uh, rationalization of the code of practice, a bit more light touch for the smaller volume, um, uh, uh, and, and potentially banking and longer storage of, of material. The, the, um, the, our European um, uh, colleagues have a grand banque approach um, where material is, is stored and then moved on. The big issue that we have with, uh, uh, with, with the DALCOP is having a timely um, uh, site for the uh, soil and stone to be received on. Um, and you know, perhaps by having uh, that sort of approach, it would uh, create a more consistent and reliable structure. On, on to the next slide, please. And um, with that better use of technologies and tools, uh, sharing better understanding, uh, having uh, quality baselines as, uh, as Bridget well pulled out, um, so that we can share what, uh, what good practice um, uh, would be for soil diversity. Um, uh, uh, training and support was a, another uh, a strong uh, opportunity that was identified, a common competence standard and framework um, that we could all work to, irrespective of, uh, of land sector. I, I think I've probably said enough, hopefully that's whet your appetite. Um, we, we are clearly as a group excited uh, for soils and stones, that we've had this opportunity to raise its profile and raise awareness. And um, I was just moving on to the next slide. Um, but um, yeah, we thank you for your, your interest and um, uh, um, um, joining us today. Uh, really looking forward to the discussions um, that we'll be having now. Uh, look forward to your questions and hopefully you can see a part that you might wish to play in how we can collaborate and work together to improve the quality, the health and the more efficient reuse of soils and stones between our respective sectors. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Uh, really great. Uh, there was a question that came up into the chat as you were talking about, um, are we making this available? Yes, the slides and the recording will be, um, be available for you all afterwards if there's any part that you missed and you want to go back to. Uh, 
So we're now going to move on to some of the uh, supporters as well and just hear some of their perspectives before we move on to the panel. So uh, first of all, um, I'm really pleased to welcome Adam John and Adam is the Chief Executive of the Institution of Environmental Sciences and has been a key supporter as have uh, CMs from within his organisation. So um, hi Adam, over to you. Hi, so firstly thank you to SOCM for inviting me to say a few words. Um, I don't have any slides and I don't want to recap too much on what other speakers have already said. So I'll just say a few things about soils and the report from mine and the Institution of Environmental Sciences perspective. Um, I suspect I might be preaching to the converted with the attendees today, but we are forever underlining the importance of soils. Soil is the foundation of every terrestrial ecosystem. It is where a quarter of the species of our planet live. Healthy soils provide a multitude of goods and services for society, food, fiber, and clean water, regulation of the carbon and nitrogen cycles, nutrient recycling, water storage, regulation of disease and detoxification of pollutants. But soils are in crisis. According to the Global Land Outlook, 4 billion tonnes of fertile soil are lost every year through intensive farming alone. And that's just a small part of the big picture, with the same report estimating six times as much as being lost overall. As Bridget highlighted earlier, the situation is no different here in the UK, where an estimated third of our soils are degraded, where 1 million hectares are at risk of erosion, and where nearly 3 million tonnes of topsoil are lost every year to wind and water erosion. Unfortunately, new soil forms at extremely low rates, about one tonne per hectare per year. So it takes hundreds of years to form even just a few centimetres. In many parts of the world, we are losing soil resources far more quickly than they can regenerate. Erosion and depletion are just part of a whole list of other challenges, including contamination, compaction, sealing, organic matter loss, salinization, acidification, and nitrification, all of which are posing threats to the health of soil resources. When you look from the perspective of compound risk vulnerabilities, there should be no doubt that there is a looming crisis for soils and our other natural resources. When you look at the other big environmental crises we're facing, climate change, biodiversity loss, food security, our responses to all of them rely to some extent on the land that we live on and the quality of the soil resources we have at our disposal. So it's critical that we safeguard them. The IES is supporting this report, not just for its quality, but because it represents all of the ideals that we stand behind. It's evidence-based, it draws on a multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary perspectives, and it deals with the natural system, which is often underappreciated. I remember from my own time at SOCM the challenges involved in identifying topics that cut across the member bodies and the difficulties in forging a common approach from the differing worldviews that come from such a diverse profession. Martin in particular and the whole Soils and Stone Task Group and the SOCM staff should therefore be commended for their foresight in identifying a topic and their diplomacy and skill in forging a consensus, particularly just having had the context from Martin that you all only met in person once. The results, I'm pleased to say, are a coherent and useful document that serves as an advertisement of the expertise that SOCEMF can draw upon from its broad membership. Just take a look at the number of different professional bodies the authors are drawn from. At the IES, we know how important soil systems are, which is why we released our own report last year, which I'll link to in the chat box in a minute calling for a practice-based approach to managing land and soil. Our report was looking at the big issues facing land and soil, and we are very clear that the evidence shows how important good practice and environmental professionals will be in tackling these big issues. Today, this report by the Society for the Environment is giving another step on that important journey. It gives professionals those key links to find the guidance and resources they need to put best practice into action. And it supports the crucial knowledge sharing exercise that our report identified as a fundamental aspect of the way in which we need to approach land and soil. Where the IS report called for best practice to be put on the front lines of the battle to improve our environment, this report is helping equip professionals with the tools they need to succeed in that battle. The report is an excellent resource of high quality insights, which will be especially important for helping chartered environmentalists and the wider environmental community to spread best practice underlined by evidence. 
by breaking the big picture down into themes. The report helps professionals gain real practical insights, providing them with case studies and signposting them to guidance, ensuring that they can take an evidence-based action to enhance their work. But you can also read the report the other way, with the case studies clearly linked to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, allowing the reader to see how practical action links to the achievements of these goals. That comprehensive approach is crucial. As environmental professionals, we recognize that natural systems don't easily fit into geographical borders or social boundaries. So it's vital that professionals are able to address them across contexts. We need to be able to address the nuances of these resources in the context of agriculture, carbon management, soil water dynamics, land contamination, and all of their interactions with natural systems. From the perspective of the IS, that is especially important important, given how much multidisciplinary work our members take part in. Using the report, environmental professionals now have one more key source of knowledge to help guide them in their work. Soils and stone will be the essential components in the relationship between society and the land we live on. Managing soils and landscape is vital for our future. Promoting healthy soils and good management of landscapes has associate benefits for biodiversity, soil carbon capture, healthy meat production, better diets and nature-based solutions to so many of our landscape problems, including flood risk management. Soil management across all sectors is something that needs change in relevant policy and legislation to maximise reuse of soils and stone and minimise the disposal of valuable materials. The report fills an important gap in the wider landscape, telling us how we can work together and collaborate. It also underscores the urgency of the situation, highlighting to policymakers why they need to act now on soils and stones to achieve their objectives. The report sets out some practical steps that can be taken to improve the overall approach to soils and stones. But perhaps more importantly, it gives those involved in policy decisions an insight into what best environmental practice looks like. It is inherent, inherently collaborative. The report has something for everyone involved in soils and stones, and the insights it shares will be fundamental going forward. You can see throughout the report how valuable that collaborative approach has been, and I'm pleased that IS members have been able to support the Society for the Environment in producing such a promising and well-evidenced resource. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. Um, really appreciate those words. Um, some things are really important to us at SOCM. Um, professional standards is one and collaboration and, and enabling RCMs to work together. So um, thank you for that. We, we very much appreciate it. Um, OK, so we're now going to move on to Eleanor Reid. Eleanor is the incoming chair of the Professional Practice Committee of the British Society of Soil Science. So hi, Eleanor, over to you. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me to talk for a couple of minutes about the launch of this SOC N for Source and Stone report. So the British Society of Soil Science was founded in 1947 and brings together those working within academia, practitioners implementing soil science in industry, and all those working with or with an interest in soils. Soils are essential for life on Earth. And it is our aim to make a positive difference in the sustainable management and long-term security of soils that is critical to solving the environmental and societal challenges we face today, highlighted by the stark statistics both Bridget and Adam have already mentioned. These form the backbone of our 2020 to 2025 strategy, in which seven key actions are set out to deliver our aim and mission. There is the ever increasing understanding that soils are essential for the delivery of our terrestrial ecosystem services and that sustainable development and management delivered through professional, competent practitioners is a critical component to protecting this finite resource. This scientific understanding, communication, engagement and professional competence are key aspects to our strategy. Next slide, please. And communicating is imperative. Soil is a fundamental resource. It's generating the food we eat, it's keeping our water clean and helping mitigate climate change. But the problem we have with soil is that it doesn't really get noticed. And that's because it's largely hidden. For example, I imagine a lot of you took advantage of the nice weather this weekend and went for a walk. 
where you would have been able to see the trees and the vegetation. You would have seen the river flowing through the hills and you'd be able to hear the birds. But what you wouldn't necessarily see is the soil, which is supporting all of those components of the natural world. So it's critical we raise the awareness of soil so it gets recognised. And it's the challenge of societies, including the British Society of Soil Science, in getting the message across in the interest of soils. And we promote research and education, both academically and in practice, and build collaborative partnerships to help safeguard our soil for the future. This includes hosting the World Congress of Soil Science in Glasgow next year with the theme Soil Science, Crossing Boundaries, Changing Society, providing an important platform for knowledge transfer, collaboration and driving forward changes to see the sustainable management and protection of our soils. Next slide, please. It's so important to emphasize that our soil resource is finite, given the length of time it takes to naturally form, and it can be easily lost or damaged through inappropriate land use, land management and development. And whilst the negative impacts can be quite alarming, we should focus on the opportunities and strive to not only protect this resource, but enhance it. And the amazing thing about soils is that they are so complex and variable. Their physical, chemical and biological characteristics can vary over really small areas. And these have major influences on their capabilities to perform different ecosystem services. As soils occur across most of the country, from our high productivity arable land right through to our urban soils, many people's work is either directly or indirectly linked to the soil, from your local farmer to quarry operatives, from sports pitch specialists to EIA practitioners. So to assist clients in identifying and engaging practitioners with the appropriate combination of qualifications, knowledge and skills to carry out soil related work to a high standard, the British Society of Soil Science has 10 working with soil competencies all of which are available on the Society website. Next slide, please. To promote the use sustainable management and use of soils, we've recently published three guidance notes, assessing agricultural land classification surveys in England and Wales, written primarily for development planning and control professionals a land and soil quality guidance note written to advise agricultural and environmental consultants on how they can obtain and make best use of the available soil and land quality resources, and benefiting from soil management in development and construction, written to promote protection of soils and the important functions they support within the planning system. The topic of these guidance notes highlights that it's not just soil scientists who work with soil, but also your ecologists, your landscape architects, forest managers, planners, construction workers, environmental generalists, all of whom need a good understanding of soils and how they influence the wider environment. This launch event is the perfect example of the wide range of professions who all understand that we need to protect our soils. We need to cut across all the interdisciplinary areas across the various organizations and bring them together to help unify the data establish best practice, communicate those key messages and provide a new coherent way of thinking about soils. And that's why we're all here today, communicating, engaging and celebrating this new collaborative report. Uh, next slide, please. So on behalf of the British Society of Soil Science, I would like to extend our thanks to the SOC ENV and the authors of the Soils and Stone Report for inviting us to contribute to this important publication. Land use changes arising from development are readily understood, but the effects of these changes on soils are largely unseen and unknown until they are damaged or displaced by development, when it can be too late to make good use of this resource. Minimising soil disturbance, securing the beneficial reuse of the displaced soils and ensuring the suitable management of the soils can help mitigate the loss or damage of this finite resource. The important aspect of this is that the soil resource on site is understood through a soil survey undertaken by a trained, competent soil surveyor 
to establish the characteristics of the soil, how it changes across the site. Does the texture change? Does the depth change? What's the nutrient status? These will all determine how the soils need to be handled, how they'll be restored, where to restore them, what habitat can they support? This will inform the landscape plan and potentially create some beautiful thriving habitats or facilitate the reuse of these soils elsewhere to create habitats. However, none of this can be achieved if the soils are simply mucked away during construction. And this report pulls out the importance of soils and stone as a resource, not a waste, and the need to consider them early in the planning process so that beneficial reuse can be designed in, minimising the amount taken off-site, but also making the reuse of soil off-site easier and eliminating the need to send any to landfill, which are reflected into the call for action points. However, this is not the end of the story. Once the soil reuse either on-site or off-site has been facilitated, it needs to be handled in such a way that it won't be damaged or lost, reducing its capacity to deliver its ecosystem services and the appropriate reuse identified, for example, tailoring the proposed vegetation species to the characteristics of the soil to increase the likelihood of successful habitat establishment and ensure the continued delivery of the soil's ecosystem services. And this relies on the implementation of best practice. The Society strongly supports the pr production of this report with its aims to establish common standards and best practice for the management of soils and stones across multiple sectors. The report highlights the need for clear guidance and in some cases regulation to, su to support the sustainable soil management, a key aim of the 25 year environment plan. And looking at the list of partners in the report, Filling an entire page makes me really positive about the future for soils, with so many groups interested not only in soils, but understanding that change needs to happen, and not just any change, but clearly thought out and considered change based on practical experience, scientific principles, understanding and evidence. Now certainly feels like a great time to be a soil scientist. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so now is your chance to ask questions. So first, before we, uh, we move on to the questions, I'm just gonna introduce to you the panel. Uh, so we have the, uh, the chairs of our various subgroups. So you've already heard from Martin, who was our task group leader. We also have Joe Jackson, who chaired the engineering construction and landscaping section. Robert Earle was our Deputy Chair of the Land Management, Agriculture, Forestry and Conservation section. Jane Rickson, Chair Health of Healthy Soils, Natural Capital and Carbon Management. And Paul Dumble, Chair of the Climate Change and Soil Water Dynamics. So afternoon, everybody. Um, if you would like to ask a question, you can either pop it into the Q&A section below or alternatively, if, if you raise your hands and uh, Sarah will help me spot who has a hand raised for a question. So um, afternoon, everybody. I'm going to start off with a couple that we were sent before, if that was OK. Um, and I'm going to come round to each of you on this question. So um, starting this off is what would be the main opportunity for collaboration on Soils and Stones? We've talked a lot about this being a really broad partnership. Um, but what do you think is the main opportunity we've got from this collaboration? Uh, Joe, can I come to you first? Talk about putting me on the spot. <laughs> we like to do that. We know you can handle it. <laughs> the main opportunity for collaboration. Um, I think a, a large um, thrust of what we came up with um, in the team I was working with was the need for harmonisation around some of the, the ways that these resources are dealt with. Um, so I'm going to be appropriately vague on this and say that I think there is an opportunity or the need the opportunity needs to be grasped whereby the regulatory and governmental agencies that set some of the rules are um, led hopefully to harmonizing some of the the rules 
to allow a more efficient reuse of this resource and, and actually to have some consistency across the approach. Obviously, soil and stones are highly heterogeneous and we are aware of the challenges, but the other layer of complex, complexity presented is that the different regulatory agencies um, and the different, um, specifically, let me talk about the Environment Agency around waste, the Environment Agency around contaminated soils, HMRC around the landfill tax rules. Um, there is an area there that, and, and again, the Environment Agency after waste around permitry as well. There's, there's an area, an opportunity there where I believe we can um, make some headway into making more of this resource available for beneficial reuse. Okay, thanks, thanks, Joe. Sorry for putting you on the spot. Right. Uh, uh, Jane, could we come to you? Sure. Yes. Hello. Afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for the question. I think, as a, um, a scientist, I, I would say that there's huge opportunities of working across sectors. So I think soil scientists in particular have tended to work um, in, in particular land uses. So we have soil scientists working in agriculture, um, horticulture, you know, arable land, grassland. And I think there's a huge opportunity to work across sectors. Um, there seems to be quite a gap between say the construction industry and um, agriculture, for example. And I think at the end of the day, soils are soils are soils and uh, managing those soils to get the most out of them in terms of these ecosystems, goods and services that we've heard about. So I think um, I would like to see the opportunity of working across sectors, that we're not in our silos, that, that we, are, we, we learn from people who are working with urban soils, for example, um, as well as agricultural soils. And as I say, I think the construction industry, you know, we've heard that the, the government um, a drive is to build back better. So construction industry is going to be very important. I think working cross sector, that's where I would see the opportunity. Thanks, Jane. Yeah, really clear. Um, Paul, let's come to you. Hello, I'm on. Hi, Paul. It was a microphone. <laughs> right, uh, opportunities. Um, I think because of the urgency of the need uh, to take action, particularly with climate impacts, particularly with the degradation of the soil. These need to be done at scale and bringing together, particularly uh, the main aim of the report is to bring together and develop through the education system, professionals uh, with the right skills, knowledge, competences uh, to deal with these phenomenal challenges that face us and the challenges are facing us, you know, they're not 30 years away anymore, they're now. And um, we, need, we need to do something. And I think that is what, this is the first part of that mobilization of the massive resources that need to be applied to the problems that we're facing, particularly with soil. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, um, I couldn't couldn't agree more. Uh, Robert, let's come to you. Sorry, just unmuting. Um, yeah, well, we've shown, I think, here how we can work together. We've had a disparate group of people producing this report, so it's possible to collaborate successfully, and the report shows that. I think, um, for my part, we're looking initially at collaboration with policymakers, particularly in government. So it's bringing in people who can change um, the views around you know, how agriculture works and um, what opportunities there are. I was greatly encouraged by President Biden's um, talk on Thursday in relation to um, climate change, particularly, that we're at a moment of great peril, but we're at a moment of extraordinary opportunity. So I think, you know, working with those opportunities with policymakers is our first priority. Second priority I will put down to working collaboratively with those who deliver education, um, not just professionals um, in professional education, but also children as well, who will be inspired really 
uh, for the future so that they don't go hungry, which is you know, a real possibility if we don't get this right. Um, and collaboration with practitioners um, is important, but I'd put that third in that, uh, you know, we, we, need, we need the, um, the drawing together of lots of different best practices into one best practice. So uh, that will take time. But I think we can, we can inspire initially through influence and working collaborative, collaboratively with policymakers and with educators. Yeah, thank you. That Obviously, that policy part is really important. I know um, just over the last week, reflecting on, as you say, the Biden statement, some of those others that were made last week as well, how many people talk about uh, the climate? How many people talk about planting trees? Occasionally, you get a mention of peat, but that's kind of where it ends um, as well. So there's a much bigger, a much bigger conversation to be had. Uh, Martin, if you don't mind, I'm going to switch questions coming to you to move to one that's been put in the uh, the question bank, mm -hmm. which was about the Grand uh, Bonk scheme it, that you've mentioned in the uh, in the report. Sorry, um, it says the report work in uh, does it work in a cross sector way? Are you not just limited to construction, which is a limitation of the Clare Dow Cop? I think that's a great question, Emma. Um, thank you to whoever posed that. I think the challenge that we've got is that. Um, as uh, uh, as Jane rightly said, soil is soil is soil. Um, uh, there is no sector uh, barrier that we should put up to how we collaborate on this most vital and important of materials. Um, uh, I think if we are going to have material reuse centres, um, then that centre should be used by every practitioner. So uh, landscapers, um, any of the Bali members, horticultural associations, we should all have com confidence in the material that's coming out of a Grand Banque Centre or whatever we want to call it, um, that we go to that centre and we know that we're going to get a, uh, a, 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 um, a quality of material for the use that we're going there for. So if it's a recycled aggregate, then it is a recycled aggregate that is all aggregate that has nothing else in it um, that is non-aggregate based. Uh, that we have a topsoil that is, you know, it might be manufactured topsoil with a blending of material, but it's to a standard um, that we could use for a horticultural um, basis as well as for uh, landscaping around a, uh, a new school. Uh, for example. Um, and so I don't think that we should constrain ourselves. I think the, the limitation that there may be around Claire's Dowcop is, yeah, its origin began in 2008 uh, with um, uh, the, as it was then, a focus on contaminated land applications in real environments, which is what Claire stands for. Uh, and the Dowcop um, the definition of waste code of practice was designed to, uh, and, and is, and, and works well to enable um, the designation of potential waste as a material for reuse in situ or uh, on another site. Now, that other site does not have to just be another construction site. Uh, it could be a, um, a land development. It could be an estate that's looking to build levels. It could be uh, for agricultural use in the right uh, in the right application. Um, the qualified person that's uh, uh, appointed for each of the the schemes is is very able to determine um, the uh, the material that's available and the uh, assure that with the certainty of uh, that it will be reused that it's suitable to be reused. In that, in that new site, so long as there's um, the, the right planning applications and everything that goes with that. Um, so we, I don't think we should limit ourselves to a particular sector where material is arising. And uh, I think you know, if, if we think of it more collegiately, that we've got a, a, a great efficiency and an opportunity to, um, to, to do that. And, I think Emma just coming back to to the earlier question in terms of collaboration. I think 
this is a great example that every aspect of each of our sectors has the opportunity, whether it's through, um, uh, as, as, as Robert well put it, whether it's through policymakers, uh, educators, or practitioners, that irrespective of sector, we we all you know respect and understand the soil and stone that we are working with, and work with that material in collaboration to a common standard. And I think if we can get to that place in the next five years, we will be in in a much better place. Um, I suppose we we'll probably just reflect on that. In, in terms of education, my inspiration as a kid was Professor David Bellamy. Um, you know, you could not help but be inspired, or I couldn't clearly, um, by by his love for soil and the the life within it. Um, uh, who's our David Bellamy now? I'm, I'm not volunteering, but you know, who's going to be that that inspirational character um, that can help us move? uh the, the awareness on and inspire the next generation but who can also help us engage with the practitioners that are working with the soil i've, I've really struggled to find who who are the um uh the association of ground workers or earth workers anyway I, I'll, I'll end at that point thanks uh martin i mean yeah it's a it's a great question and and i said there's lots of I would say lots of role models out there from uh, across a whole range of different parts of the environmental profession and different ages as well, but so often doesn't quite get there, the kind of the David Bellamy effect, I understand, I'm showing my age now, I understand what you meant by that. Um, there was a question in the chat and um, from Ross, which I think is kind of a rhetorical question, um, asking if CMs and others should be sharing the report with their MPs. Absolutely. Uh, yes, please do. We are uh, sharing it with kind of key government departments, but anything any of you think you can do to help, to share, uh, to support, please do that. But also please reach out to us at the Society as well. We'd love to, to hear from you. Um, and as I said earlier, we are nowhere near the end of this piece of work. We're really just getting started. So if you think there's something you can do to help out, then please, please do reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. Um, I'll jump into the, into the technical groups a little bit, if I may. Uh, and Paul, can I come back to you? Because obviously you led the group on climate change um, and soil water dynamics as well. And obviously climate is such a, a big area that's getting more and more press, uh, rightly so. We've got COP coming up. Just tell us a little bit about the work of the group and what you were hoping that will come out of this work from a climate perspective. Um, yes, Emma, um, that's... Uh... That's a good question. Uh, what do we do for COP26? Um, COP26 is tremendously important, um, particularly in the UK, because uh, the UK has the leadership uh, this year. And uh, I think um, there's aspects of the report, particularly on climate change, which would be very useful in demonstrating uh, or leading, or, you know, I look at it as leading by example uh, to the rest of the world. And one of those um, particular recommendations is the, is the adoption of a policy which would apply to all land use uh, development and existing land use. And that would be a requirement uh, to reduce carbon intensity and also to improve uh, carbon sequestration on the land and both those principles to be applied universally across the developments, uh, particularly across the development sector. So, uh, for example, car reducing carbon intensity is about reducing the carbon emissions from the activities on the site and carbon sequestration is about using the land rather than uh, to emit uh, carbon uh, but to store carbon so that is in, in the creation of um, particularly in urban development of involving uh, small-scale schemes in land use such as uh, small 
I wouldn't say forestry, but uh, small tree plots and things like that, and incorporate various things which encourage the development of uh, habitats and uh, other um, and increase the range of uh, biodiversity, which uh, up until now has been uh, looked at as a nuisance. Uh, and we need to work with nature rather than against it. We can't, we can't just eradicate uh, everything uh, because it's a nuisance to us human sure, sure. living and things yeah, like sure. that. So um, it's a matter of incorporating all those principles. And by doing that across all land use, you get this um, situation. So it's applied with agriculture. Again, you can have different types of agriculture. There's these, these different things between you know, whether we use our agricultural land for forestry, whether we use that forestry to create biochemicals and uh, other materials that will be needed if we close down our fossil fuel industries. So you've got all these little dilemmas coming along. And, and then you've got this big thing, as Michael Gov said in 2017, where he says, you know, if we continue to degrade our land in 30 to 40 years, the soil fertility will have basically gone. Mm, Um, These are huge challenges. They are indeed. And I think people more and more are realising that kind of system approach. I'm just going to come to um, to Joe and to Jane, actually. Um, I mean, Joe, in terms of the kind of the engineering construction and landscaping group and Jane from the soil science group. I mean, obviously... From a soil science perspective, these are issues that have been known about for a long time. I just wonder, um, Jane, if I can come to you first, do you, do you feel that there is a, a kind of a growing understanding in the engineering and construction world that actually some, something is changing? Sorry, our names are very similar. Did you say Joe or Jane? Sorry. <laughs> I'll start with you, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> oh, with me. Um, yes, thank you. Yeah, so I, I, I certainly think that, um, you know, the, the big drivers here, things like net zero and how we achieve, how we can achieve net zero, whether it's in agriculture or construction or, or any sector. And I think the soil's role in that is, is increasingly recognised and, and picking up on Paul's point, the ability for soils to, um, first of all, emit carbon, uh, which is obviously an issue because it adds to atmospheric CO2, which is associated with warming up um, the, 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 the globe and leading to climate change and, and global warming and so on. Uh, so it emits, we also lose carbon through processes like soil erosion, um, but we can treat our soils to make sure that it grows enough vegetation so that we can sequester the CO2 out of the atmosphere And then, of course, soils are a fantastic store of carbon. And even if we, so the science, those processes are pretty well understood by scientists. But what is really exciting is that we as practitioners, applied scientists, can actually manage the soils to do all of those things better, to reduce the emissions, try to look after our peatland soils, for example, to avoid those emissions, make sure that we're not losing carbon through soil erosion, Um, making sure we're growing crops and vegetation. We we don't have any bare soil that is then um, susceptible to carbon losses, either through emissions or through through erosion. Um, And then again, storing our soil, making uh, storing our carbon within our soil. And and my point is really that we the management practices are known. We can do this. We know how to do this. It's just a matter of, of, of advertising, promoting those best practices to make sure that we reduce those emissions, we increase the sequestration of atmospheric carbon, and we store that carbon for good uh, within the soil store. And as I say, again, picking up on my point earlier, that applies to all sectors, whether you're a farmer or whether you're an urban planner uh, trying to work out what is the best way to sequester CO2 from the atmosphere. Thanks, Jane. So so Joe, coming over to you then from that engineering perspective, do you agree with what Jane has just said, that it's understood? I, I do. I think that um, from, from a construction perspective, um, we kind of have the, a, a real advantage here or a real opportunity that has been capitalised on to a degree insofar as one of the biggest uh, 
contributors to waste in terms of tons is, is the construction and, and demolition industry. And when you look at the life cycle of a project, and if you want to report, as we're increasingly required to, how much uh, you know avoidance of, of landfill has been completed or how much beneficial reuse has been completed, in terms of tonnages, um, by being smart with surplus soil and stones and potentially recycling aggregates or, or recycling building materials into secondary aggregates, we can really, really, really put some big numbers on the board in terms of project uh, recyclability. Um, we also have the benefit there as well of if we can use the science and use our understanding of the rules and indeed influence the rules through this type of uh, publication to, to um, beneficially reuse this material, then we can take um, lots of vehicle movements off the road, which in themselves are obviously um, uh, a big source of, of, of CO2. So I think that it is relatively well understood, um, but I think we've also got a few hangovers from certain um, uh, aspects, and I'm gonna just say it, um, for example, BS3 AA2 for topsoil. We, we, we get very much hung up on a British standard for something which is, you know, is that the best thing to put a British standard against when, when lots of naturally occurring topsoils may not even meet that standard? So I think we, we unfortunately, in, in the world of contracting, have to come to a point of, uh, you know, some sort of binary point that something's suitable or it's not. And I think the real um, advantage um, that, that we have is, is that if we can understand the uh, if we can reuse material on a risk-based approach which, you know, which we do and we can then there's a great advantage but we still get tied up with certain um specifications that come out with contracts so i think there's there you go the contractor saying should be more done on the client side what, what a surprise that is <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Yes, yeah, say so the the going back to the first point we had earlier on around policy and legislation um, uh, is really critical to this. Um, I'm just going to come to you, Robert. I'm just conscious of time as well, and then I'll finish off with Martin. So, um, again, just uh, kind of your views on um, on some of those legislation. Obviously, we've heard a lot um, in recent times about people. Um, lots of campaigns around lots of planting trees and we need to plant a million trees here, there and everywhere. Just just kind of your view on on kind of that approach and how that's how that's going. Is that helpful? The potential risks around that. Sorry, that's a really big question in not very much time at all, but particularly the kind of the soil issues that come from that. Yeah, um, I didn't want this to be a Jeremiah. Um, I was really with this group trying to look at the, um, the economic um, opportunities, if you like, and really one of our main focuses was to maintain economic productivity. We have a lot of people to feed, and um, I think under President Nixon's um, um, tenure, that his agricultural advisor said, okay, if we want to go organic, which 50 million Americans are going to starve? <laughs> um, you know, we... we, we <laughs> We need to think about how we maintain soil quality um, and planting trees to some extent does take the pressure off. So there are ways of looking at this. And I think that was brought out earlier. I think it's by, um, by Emma actually, when um, she said it would have been nice to have made more of the non-soil or non-agricultural type of food production. And I think it, we, we've hinted at this throughout the report. Um, particularly in relation to growing crops on substrates through hydroponics. Um, I live in an area where we grow an awful lot of strawberries in polytunnels and we don't use the soil. And through that, you have a very high value crop with a, with a very high input of, um, of, a, of a various infrastructure, you know, metal tunnels, plastic over the top, um, bags of uh, this 
of the substrate. But it, it's, it's economic, it, it, it's, it's great. If we go to vertical farming, where we're building in effect factories in cities, where we are growing high value crops at the point of need, um, we are taking pressure off soil. And that, that means we can then look at some of the agricultural land being returned perhaps to um, its, uh, its original state. And you can, through organic farming, get some degree of benefit, I think, from people who will buy organic food. Um, so I, I think what we were looking at there was really finding opportunities, um, but at the same time, trying to develop a position where soils can begin to recover and um, be, you know, this, this, this wonderful resource for carbon capture. It's probably the government's greatest natural resource for that. And that point is made very clearly in the report. If you want to capture carbon, soil is the way to do it. And if you are farming the way that we are currently farming um, by covering everything with glyphosate and having the soils in effect barren throughout the winter, you are not adding much to the soils. In fact, soil organic loss was one of, one of our key issues. Forestry may to some extent return some of that organic matter to the soil. So um, yeah, I, I, I would say that that's a good way forward, but all of this needs to be paid for. And uh, I had a good quote from, um, what was it? Uh, a book called An English Pastoral by James Rebanks, who is a farmer. And he says, um, we can work the land and still have healthy soils. And uh, we just, Want, you just need really to have enough will to legislate for it and to pay for it. So ultimately, it all does come down to economics. But I come back to what President Biden said, the environment and the economy are inextricably linked. And what we don't want to do is spend the capital that's already in the soil so that we lose that and in effect have soils that are infertile in 60 odd years. Sure. Thanks, Robert. Um, Ellen has actually um, put a comment uh, for you as well. So I totally agree. I call it soil sparing technologies in my talk because it plays to language of land sparing or sharing with the agri-environment community you talk so much about. So, yeah, thank you for that as well. OK, Martin, I'm going to come to you uh, for the last question before we just wrap up. Um, yeah. An opportunity just for you to... Uh, to kind of sum up your views on the report and what we're going and where you would like it to go next before I summarise the next steps. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Emma. I mean, firstly and foremost, it has been um, a career in life privilege and honour to corral uh, 31 other chartered environmentalists and have that opportunity to, uh, with with some very notable um, uh, 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 colleagues who know far more about soil and stone than I do but just to have the opportunity to uh, voice concerns to to raise that voice um, uh, as a profession for for soils and stones and to uh, elicit the uh, 32 actions uh, the calls to action that we've brought forward um, where would I like this to go next um, I would be really disappointed if this just stopped here, that we didn't see an outcome for our efforts thus far. Uh, I really look forward to the opportunity of getting us all in a room uh, when we're safe and able to do so, uh, and to rightly uh, celebrate, um, physically pat each other on the back for getting this far, because it's no mean feat to put all of the time, effort, as much as it's been great to use the technology and hasn't it worked well, but to do it in a 2D environment rather than in a 3D is never quite as human and effective. So I'm looking forward to us getting back into physical presence and hopefully involving others that have heard today or are listening back to this recording and might be inspired to join us, um, whether they are indeed the next David Bellamy or just want to be part of a team of people who want to make a difference in our parts of our respective sectors to work together and to make a real meaningful difference, whether it's at, at a policy level, 
uh, working with education, working between sectors and practitioners and, and helping those who are physically sat in their cabs today, whether it's um, spraying the fields or uh, to moving the, uh, the, the hard ground as it's rock solid, given that we're probably now going to have the driest April on record, uh, according to the Met Office's view the other day. Um, you know, we, we are entering increasingly difficult times. So it, the onus for me as an environmental professional is how, how can I work more collaboratively with you and, and other chartered professionals um, to, to really make a meaningful difference before it's too late. Um, and, and for us to then show what we've done, to raise it loud and clear, and to help those who are playing their part um, but not having a voice or a, a means to share that, to, ha to have the opportunity that they can, you know, um, that they can work with us, uh, pro project teams on a particular topic or um, helping form uh, an association of ground workers, maybe, I don't know, something like that, uh, where we can get the right people together um, who are, you know, driving with their, their, uh, their tunners, uh, moving this soil and stone around today. How can we get them to work together uh, with us? Um, you know, we, we know the theory, but making it work in practice, uh, avoiding compaction, uh, making sure that what's left uh, is good for another day and that we have that pos positive legacy for, for tomorrow and years to come. So ho hopefully that, that answers the, uh, the question, Emma. Um, yeah, it does. It does. I think that's a great answer, Martin. Thank you. I very much look forward to seeing everybody in, in one room and seeing some pieces rather than uh, rather than TV screen and my cat who's fighting with me. <laughs> that, well, that is certainly something to look forward to, isn't it? It's been really nice to see you in 3D. Um, so thank you uh, to uh, Martin. Thank you to our panel and um, all of the other speakers today. Um, I could talk to you all for days about this and... Um, Unfortunately, we don't have time, but really thank you uh, for your time today and your expertise and your time in creating this report as well. So, um, Sarah, if we can just move on to the next slide. Um, I just want to summarise the next steps. Before I do that, I just also want to thank Sarah and the SOC Ember team who has been instrumental in pulling this together. And it's been a huge piece of work for her on top of everything else. So a massive thank you to Sarah for that as well. Um, okay, so next steps. As we've said a number of times, this is nowhere near the end. This is really uh, the beginning and we've got a lot of work to do. And these are the steps that we would like to take. Now, if you think that you can help us in any way with anything, please reach out. Uh, we'd love to, to speak to you on, on any of these things. So first of all, um, we, we recognise that we need some resource to move this forward and we've got a lot to do. So we want to find some resource to lead our program board on this. We're gonna be working on that. Um, if you've got a way that you think you can help us with that, please uh, do reach out. We also um, intend to appoint a program board. Martin has already uh, gone over the, the kind of the action plan and you've seen kind of 30 plus actions in there. So there's a lot to do, um, but we're really keen to appoint that program board with our chairs to really look at each of these themes um, in detail as well. Um, and out of that, we will be producing some timelines with some calls to action with some short, medium and long term goals in there as well. I think we've got some really quick wins that we can do. Um, but there's some things that are going to take some time as well, but we can work on those. Um, we've talked a lot today about communications um, and working with partners to raise the profile of soil. We've, um, Adam mentioned it and others as well about uh, water and air. And, and I love the expression of soil being the Cinderella. Um, so we really do need to focus on that um, as well. And of course, involving wider stakeholders and other parties as well. So um, that's where we are going with this next. Um, if you do want to reach out, you can get me directly at the society. It's emma.wilcox at socemv.org.uk. Um, you can, I'm on Twitter as well. You've got the Socemv HQ um, details for Twitter as well or if you go onto our website the the phone number and everything is there as well so whichever way works best for you um, be great to hear from you all so um, we are coming up to the end of time so I'm going to finish just a few minutes early give you a chance to stretch your legs uh, go and have a look outside <laughs> it's a sunny day in the Midlands I hope it is where you are as well 
um, grab some fresh air uh, before your next uh, session starts. I'm sure you're, as you're very busy people. So thank you again uh, to everybody for all of your time. Um, and we look forward to talking to you about this again in the future. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>